Thank you, Attila, and thanks, Oscar and the organizers. Uh, we're sorry we can't be there in person. Um, and let's let's see how this goes. Um, I'm, I'm to present the first part here, and then Matthias will take over. Um, Matthias is, is stuck um, on the tube uh, in London, uh, but, but uh, hopefully he will be online by the time that I finish the, this first part. Um, so um, this, what, what we're gonna present is, is, a, is work in progress. It's a, it's a paper that we're working on. We have been working on and, and we're still working on it. There's still lots of work to do on it. Uh, so we, we appreciate any kind of feedback that, that um, you might be able to give us. Um, we are we're interested in populism uh, and we're interested in accounting for, for populism. And this paper is it, it has a theoretical uh, aim, but it also has a more uh, empirical aim. So, so theoretically, we, we start with from Laclau, from Ernesto Laclau's theory of, of populism, but, but we want to, to add something to it uh, because we think there's a, there's a specific problem with it that, that we can try to address uh, by, by adding something to it, which, which I'll explain in, in, in a moment. Uh, so so we, we're interested in understanding uh, populism, a particular kind of, or at least one particular kind of populism, uh, so far right or radical right populism, um, of which there are many, unfortunately, many examples. Um, Duterte in, in the Philippines and Trump in, in the US, uh, who are now uh, ex presidents. Um, but they're also um, someone like, like Kast in, in, in Chile. Uh, fortunately, he, he didn't make it to the presidency, uh, but he was close. And, and now, just recently, just last week, uh, Rodolfo Hernandez Suarez in, in Colombia, who was also fairly close. Um, a similar kind of, of far right or radical right uh, populism. And then there's Bolsonaro, uh, and our, our case is Bolsonaro and Bolsonarism, um, who has many similarities with these other um, right wing populists far-right populist. Um, there's also something which is more, perhaps more specific to him and which we are also interested in. And that's what we call his, uh, his uh, messianic um, form of populism. Ah, okay. So I see Mateus is here, great. Uh, so I, I'll continue. Um, so, but what is also interesting, apart from his mess messianic populism, and by the way, uh, Bolsonaro's middle name is, is Messias, uh, Jair uh, Messias Bolsonaro. Um, what is also interesting about Bolsonaro is that he, he feeds off crisis. Um, he creates crisis and then he presents himself as, as, the, as the person, the agent who will save Brazil from, from these crises. Uh, so we're focusing on this relationship between populism and crisis, and, and obviously in, in the scholarship on populism, this is, this is something that has been addressed, addressed by, by many people. Often populism is taken to be a response to a crisis, whether it's an economic crisis or a crisis of representation or a crisis of legitimacy of the institutions. Uh, in part of the literature, you, you also have the view that, um, that populism performs crisis, it, that populism uh, creates crisis. So this is what we are interested in, this relationship between populism and crisis, or, or crisis and populism. Laclau, as I'll explain in a moment, he, th he thinks about crisis in terms of dislocation. That's, his, the, that's the key concept for him to, to understand crisis. Our proposal is to think about this in terms of the nexus between crisis and what we call rupture. Uh, more specifically, we, we're looking at the ways in which crises are, are transformed as ruptures of different intensities. So, so the key terms for us are crisis, uh, rupture, and uh, intensity, and also feedback, which, which I'll come back to in a moment. But first, um, very quickly, Laclau. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on Laclau. So Laclau, he thinks about crisis in terms of dislocation, the dislocation of, of a system, a system of, in his terms, of representation, uh, a system that then when it's in crisis, when it's dislocated, cannot 
meet the demands of society, and those demands may then be articulated into a chain of equivalence. Now, then there's a, an ambiguity in, in Laclau around dislocation about his, his way of conceiving of crisis, um, which we, 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 we articulate in terms of objective and subjective in, in quotation marks. So, so on the one hand, sometimes in, in Laclau, crisis is some, it's taken to be something quote unquote objective, you have a crisis that happens, and then, but only then, do you have uh, a published, let's say, articulation of the crisis as dislocation, as a dislocation of the legitimacy of, of the representative systems, for instance. But then at other points, then you have crisis or dislocation as something we could say subjective, quotation marks, where the crisis or the dislocation is performed and, and created by the published discourse. And, and you can find that in, in different places in in Laclau, both when he talks about dislocation on its own, but also when he connects it to, to populism. Uh, and, and you have an example of it here in the, in the quote, where you have this, this uh, an example of this ambiguity or really circularity between crisis as something objective, as something external to uh, populism, and crisis as something subjective, as something internal to uh, populism. Uh, what what's also the case with, with Laclau is that uh, he he tends to to take the view that any crisis of representation has to result and you find this in in the quote here has to result in a in a public discourse that that articulates a crisis of, of representation. So, as we're looking at this relationship between crisis and, and populism. We, we're faced with with two questions here. The first, of course, is, is a more general question of whether the concept, Laclau's concept of crisis as dislocation, whether that can actually do the work that, that it's supposed to do. And the second question is whether crisis necessarily leads to populism and also what kinds of, maybe we should distinguish between different kinds of crisis uh, and different kinds of, of populism. So what would be the, the connection between different kinds of crisis and different kinds of populism? Um, and, and we try to, to address that. So with, with that in mind, we, we turn to um, the French uh, sociologist and philosopher, Edgar Moy, um, who is coming from a, a different philosophical um, uh, tradition, um, and who, by the way, will be 101 years in, in two weeks, uh, hope, hopefully. Uh, so so he's, he's still around. Uh, so like, like how he thinks about crisis in terms of dislocation, he thinks about that as, as in terms of failure um, or negativity. Uh, or he, he's a theorist of lack. And Moang is, is coming from a different perspective here because he thinks about crisis as, as a process or processes. As he, he's a process thinker. So, so crisis for, for Moang is, is not a specific point in time. It's rather a process. And that process can be, can be longer, it can be shorter. Um, it's a crisis of, or when he talks about crisis, it's about a crisis of a system. Uh, that system can be material or uh, symbolic or representational, or, or it can be both, and, and mostly it will be both, if not always. Um, what happens is then that the, the, the system loses its stability, let's say, uh, and then you have this kind of, of limbo where between on the one hand, a certain kind of disorder of, of, the, of the system, instability. And on the other hand, you get these, and this is what we're interested in, these ruptures that, that can take us in new directions. And, and that's then what we, we're interested in, how we get from, from crisis to, to rupture, and then what does that mean? So we have crisis, rupture, and then we have uh, intensities and, and feedback. Um, and now I'm gonna show you a, a table, and I'm not gonna talk about the whole table uh, and all, all the detail, uh, it's a table that we, we, are, we are working with and, and we, we, we're seeing how, how try to see how it works. Uh, and really we are, uh, at least for the purpose of, of this paper, we are only interested in one of the boxes here, which is the, the bottom right box um, where you have Bolsonaro. Um, so we, we try to distinguish between different intensities of a crisis, low, medium and, and high intensity uh, crisis. And, and ruptures. That, that's one, one distinction we're trying to make. And then the other distinction we're making is between negative and positive feedback. And, and this here, negative and positive doesn't mean anything normative. It, it's an, they are analytical categories. So when, when we talk about negative feedback, 
we're talking about how the system, which is in crisis, how that is rebalanced, let's say, through modes of adaptation and, and resilience. And when we talk about positive feedback, we're talking about how the system, how the system uh, or the, the crisis is, uh, you have a form of aggravation and acceleration also uh, in terms of speed uh, of the crisis of, of, and of contradictions and antagonisms and of the decay of, of, of the system. So that's how we, we're trying to, to make these distinctions in order to uh, focus on, on particular forms of crisis and particular forms of, of populism. Uh, and so what, what we are interested in, as I, I said, is this bottom right um, uh, box here with, with Bolsonaro. And so now I hand over to Matt. Okay, thanks Lasse, thanks a lot. Just, I'm gonna keep my uh, camera off if you guys don't mind. I hope you, can you, can you hear me? Just, yes. yeah, cool, perfect. So I'm gonna uh, keep my camera off because I am um, uh, so unfortunately time of this presentation uh, had a clash with a personal thing I had. So I'm kind of like stuck in a place here. We might hear some sounds in my background. So I do apologize for that. Is someone, is the lady in the airport announcing the flight? So I do apologize for that. So let's crack on. I think the, 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 the core piece is into, yeah, here she goes. So uh, the core thing is here for us uh, in terms of uh, Bolsonaro and the relationship with the nexus of crisis and rupture is that the emergence the evolvement and survival of Bolsonarism revolves around the way Bolsonaro connects crisis to ruptures. And also, as Lass was mentioning, the intensity, right? The intensity of Bolsonarism is directly related to the societal feedback the crisis receives. So what we're going to be doing now is to develop this idea, this core thesis, in two steps, right? The first step is to explain the emergency of Bolsonarism in response to a, a threefold crisis. And the second is focusing on uh, the way in which Bolsonaro evolved and survived during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, right? So before the emergence of Bolsonarism as a potential a political paradigm in Brazil, the country is passing through a, severe, a, a very severe threefold crisis, right? That is its roots and, and origins. We can trace back to the 2010 um, and kind of like these threefold crises destabilized, uh, destabilized and discredited the whole political uh, uh, institutions in Brazil to the point of like reaching record levels of distrust and rejection. These threefold uh, crises um, combined economic downturn. They started to, to, to show its faces in late 2012, political uh, crisis, legitimation crisis with, uh, that was basically ignited by the Operation Car Wash, but of course we can trace back to, you know, Mensalão and other political scandals in Brazil and social uh, dissatisfaction. These three crises combined created a conjuncture, a, a condition of possibility uh, from uh, two a very powerful ruptures to emerge, right? The first one was took place in 2013 with the mass protests in Brazil. And the second one, was Dumas Oha Rousseff's uh, impeachment, right? These two were eventful ruptures that in the, in the Brazilian political system. And uh, I'm not getting into details of the two of them, um, but they were like super significant because first, the 2013 mass protest, it disrupted the political system to the point of uh, dislocating PT's and Lula's political dis discourse from the, the hegemonic position he had, right? And Dilma's Rousseff impeachment basically created, was supposed to have a negative feedback and stabilize the political system, taking, ta taking PT out of the equation. But what happened was it accelerated the economic crisis and the political crisis in um, Michel Temer's government. So it was a positive feedback that accelerated and created these massive peripheral crises. So it's suffice to say that from 2000, uh, early 2010s, you know, 2011, 12 to 18, this crisis, this process of crisis was, you know, increasing with different negative and positive, positive feedback and two big high intensity ruptures, right? And in the 2018 election, 
this crisis, threefold crisis, forged a conjuncture uh, of institutional vacuum where uh, traditional political parties and politicians, they couldn't mobilize the electorate and they left the space open for um, dissonant voices such as Bolsonaro to start gaining momentum and attract the satisfied uh, people, right? And it was in this complex social context of disorder, dislocation, chaos, that the combination of, of crisis and ruptures made it possible for you know, more radical voices or more, more radical form of populism to emerge. And, and, and here, Bolsonaro plays a very important role because he managed at this moment of political vacuum, crisis and, and, and rupture, he managed to establish himself as a, a political outsider. He was an outsider, but he managed to establish himself as one, as someone defending the people against oppression, against the system, the elite, but more importantly, he established himself as someone that would save the nation from moral corruption, political and economic crisis. And he forged a broad alliance right, uh, with different social sectors from you know, the army, upper elite, middle class to, to the market, agribusiness. So of course, like many leaders, many political leaders, Bolsonaro played not only with fears and insecurity, but you, he also, and he also articulated with right wing cliches, right? You know, like um, defending uh, traditional values, defending the family, being ultra, uh, he was advocating a, a, a very kind of like ultra form of nationalism and extreme antagonism, mostly antagonizing with the, the left wing ideas. So he was steering with people's fears you know, and was trying to kind of like create a new social bond by arousing and liberating people's repressed desire. So it was kind of like re uh, generating a process of identification um, where, when he was positioning himself as the strong leader, right? And I think it is here that Bolsonaro became what a cloud for them to sit in trial, right? He was the, the, the very, so, as a, a political signal, uh, empty signifier, he, he was the only alternative to prevent the moral debacle of another uh, PT presidency. And he elevated himself from a marginal position to one of charismatic leader, right? Congregating, amassing social anger against the system, again, against left wing, but as well as hope, right? Hope for change, desire for security, stability. So as this empty signifier, he became, he started to represent the people, but not, so, sorry, he represent a people, not the people, right? Because he was representing a specific part of the people while at the same time was constituting the people, these people identity. Uh, and one thing that is very interesting about Bolsonaro is that uh, he was the promising redemption to his people, right? And he was in a new battle and this battle was against the evil. We know that all, like many uh, uh, populist leaders, they, they, they create this enemy, but Bolsonaro's forging a battle of life and death against the evil, right? Against PT, against uh, moral decay. And he was basically kind of like renewing uh, the experience of the sacred through this holy cause, you know, as the martyr savior. And important to notice here that during the campaign trail, he was stabbed. Right, and, and because he was stabbed, he was playing this card of being the martyr, the savior that the elite was trying to kill and, and, and prevent him from reaching power. But what's also important here is different, uh, different from religious populists, you know, who are closely linked to and have political platform directly influenced by religion. Bolsonaro was never based his populist performance in, in religious values or dogmas, right? But he was using religiosity strategically as a way to give a transcendental legitimacy and substance to his platform, right? And in terms of performance, um, basically his political performance was hinging on three axes, ethics of fear and resentment, culture of aggressive and vindictive antagonism and tolerance, and resacralization of politics through the narrative of the martyr that risked his life to save the country, right? So when Bolsonaro was using slogans such as Brazil above all and God above everyone, he was not actually implying that he intended to turn Brazil into a, a theocracy, but actually to affirm his position as the God chosen 
Polico Messiah that would save the Brazilians from the crisis and chaos, and a, a Messiah that is fighting like a martyr against all evil. Right? So I, I think that's the point here that we can say that Bolsonarism is not religious populism, but the deviation of it. Right? It's a specific mode of right-wing populism that we can call messianic. So this was the context uh, of political havoc, dissertation, positive feedback, crisis, that connected, sorry, connected crisis and ruptures. And it was this condition here that created the, the possibility, conditions of possibility for Bolsonarism to emerge, to emerge as a form of radical uh, uh, populism in Brazil and become, and, and, and become a demonic, right? So that was the, the, the context and, 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 and conditions of possibility of emer um, emergency. Let's see how Bolsonaro uh, uh, used crisis and, and, and rupture as a method for survival. Sorry for the noise in my background again. Um, and I'm not quite sure how long we have. I'll try just, just to rush um, a bit through the second act. In 2018, when he was elected, actually, was... we have one more minute. One more minute. All right. So I'm just going to go very quickly here. So in the second act, during his tenure as a president, there was a massive crisis triggered by COVID, of course. So it was a threefold crisis the pandemic, which fractured the political uh, uh, landscape in Brazil, and economic downturn. These created a massive, massive uh, uh, crisis in Brazil. The Bolsonaro was, and of course there was there wasn't many there wasn't many like ruptures. It was mild ruptures all the time, several dislocations, and we had uh, at the same time negative and positive feedback. What's interesting here is that parts of the government they were trying to create uh, technical solutions to to the pandemic crisis, but Bolsonaro was mostly stuck in positive feedback. Right. He was constantly antagonizing with everyone. He created and threatening Brazilian democracy with a coup, with a military coup. Right. So just to kind of like uh, summarize Bolsonaro's performances here was that his radical antagonism actually produced a deep internalization of crisis and, and rupture into his political discourse, right? Making his political discourse actually dependent on both crisis and, and rupture. Could you just go back let's say, to, to, to the previous one? Yeah. So Bolsonaro needs crisis and rupture as a condition of possibility for his uh, populism and a strategic rhetorical device. So to wrap up the last, uh, let's go to the last, yeah, this one. So to wrap up, what we need, want to say here is that Bolsonaro emerges, survives, and evolves through crisis and rupture, right? So yeah, that's it. That's that's the wrap up. Sorry for you know going way over time. 